intention, direct and oblique intent. In law, there are two types of intention. Direct intent, also known as purpose intent, is where the consequences of a person's actions are desired. Oblique intent, also known as foresight intent, covers a situation where the consequence is foreseen by the defendant as virtually certain. Although it is not desired for its own sake, the defendant goes ahead with his actions anyway. So, a defendant has a direct intent when he wants the consequences to occur and the defendant has an oblique intent when he actually did not want the consequences but foresaw it as virtually certain. For example, Bob is a restaurant owner. He decided that he wants to make a fraudulent insurance claim on his restaurant. He decides to set the restaurant on fire during business hours. He knows that some of his customers will die and that will make his claim even stronger. In this case, he has a direct intent. He wanted the customer's death so that he can have a strong insurance claim. Let's change the situation. Bob wants to make a fraudulent claim of insurance so decides to set his restaurant on fire. He know some of his customers might die, but sincerely hopes that his customers are not harmed. Here, Bob has a bleak intent. The death of his customers was not planned, but he knew that this is virtually certain to happen. Now remember, intention differs from motive or desire. R versus Maloney, 1985. The defendant shot his stepfather, killing him. Evidence was produced that they had a good relationship. They had been celebrating the defendant's grandparents' wedding anniversary and had consumed alcohol. The rest of the family had retired to bed and the two stayed up drinking. The defendant told his stepfather that he wanted to leave the army. The stepfather was not happy at the news and berated the defendant. He told him that he could load, draw, and shoot a gun quicker than him and told him to get the guns. The defendant returned with two guns and took the challenge. The defendant was first to load and draw and the stepfather said, I don't think you have got the guts, but if you have, pull the trigger. The defendant pulled the trigger, but in his drunken state, he did not believe that the gun was aimed at the stepfather. The trial judge directed on oblique intent and the jury convicted. The Court of Appeals dismissed the appeal and the defendant appealed to the House of Lords. The defendant's conviction for murder was substituted for manslaughter and it was held by the House of Lords that it was not a case of oblique intent and the judge should not have issued a direction relating to the further expansion of intention. Lord Bridge also gave guidance on the approach for the rest on oblique intent. He said, in the rare cases in which it is necessary to direct a jury by reference to foresight of consequences, I do not believe it is necessary for the judge to do more than invite the jury to consider two questions. First, was death or really serious injury in a murder case or whatever relevant consequence must be proved to have been intended in any other case? a natural consequence of the defendant's voluntary act? Secondly, did the defendant foresee that consequence as being a natural consequence of his act? The jury should then be told that if they answer yes to both questions, it is a proper inference for them to draw that he intended that consequence. To require proof that it was the defendant's purpose to bring about a particular consequence may involve placing a very high evidential burden on the prosecution. Not surprisingly, given the above example, criminal law normally only requires proof of oblique intent, that is, foresight intent. 
as opposed to direct intent. But what test should be used to prove oblique intent? Should it be subjective or objective? A subjective test is concerned with the defendant's perspective. In relation to oblique intent, it would be concerned only with whether the defendant did foresee the degree of probability of the result occurring from his actions. An objective test looks at the perspective of a reasonable person. That is, would a reasonable person have foreseen the degree of probability of the result occurring from the defendant's actions? Looking at the intention based on foresight of consequences, it is important to note that the courts have stated that foresight of consequences can only be evidence of intention if the accused knew that those consequences would definitely happen. Thus, it is not sufficient that the defendant merely foresaw a possibility of a particular occurrence. How can a jury be directed to understand how the existence of such foresight is to be ascertained? It is arguable that since intention requires the highest degree of fault, it should be solely concerned with the defendant's perception. In addition, intention seems to be a concept which naturally requires a subjective inquiry. It seems somehow wrong to decide whether the defendant's intention was by reference to what a reasonable person would have contemplated. However, originally an objective test was applied to decide oblique intent. At one time, DPP v. Smith, 1961, AC 290, was authority for the view that a person foresaw and intended the natural and probable consequences of his acts. However, this was reversed by Parliament. Section 8 of Criminal Justice Act 1967, which now deals with how intention or foresight must be proved, provides a court or jury in determining whether a person has committed an offense, a shall not be bound in law to infer that he intended or foresaw a result of his actions by reason only of its being a natural and probable consequence of those actions. But b shall decide whether he did intend or foresee that result by reference to all the evidence drawing such inferences from the evidence as appear proper in the circumstances consequently where foresight needs to be established a person is not to be taken as intending the natural and probable consequences of his act simply because they were natural and probable although a jury may infer that from looking at the evidence. The test is therefore subjective and a jury is to decide whether the defendant's intention was from considering all the evidence. The relationship between foresight and intent was considered by the House of Lords in Hyam versus DPP and R.V. Hancock and Shankland, 1986 and by the Court of Appeal in R. V. Nedrick, 1986. The House of Lords accepted that a subjective test was applicable. However, the majority decision of the House of Lords was out of line with Section 8 in that it was accepted that foresight of consequences being highly probable was sufficient to establish intent. Lord Hailsham dissenting a point which was taken and rectified by R. V. Maloney. Lord Bridge's test on oblique intent. First, was death or really serious injury in a murder case or whatever relevant consequence must be proved to have been intended by any other case a natural consequences of the defendant's voluntary act? Secondly, did the defendant foresee that consequences as being a natural consequence of his act. The jury should then be told that if they answer yes to both questions, it is proper inference for them to draw that he intended that consequence. However, R. V. Maloney left a problem with regards to the degree of probability required. This was considered in R. V. Hancock and Shankland 1985, 3 WLR 1014. 
The degree of probability was still causing problems. In the cases of R.V. Maloney and R.V. Hancock and Shanklin were reviewed by the Court of Appeals in the R.V. Nedrick, which reformulated the test. Let's look at R.V. Nedrick 1986 in more detail. The appellant held a grudge against Viola Forshaw. He went to her house in the middle of the night, poured paraffin through her letterbox and set light to it. A child died in the fire. This trial was held before the judgment was delivered in Maloney. The judge directed the jury as follows. If, when the accused performed the act of setting fire to the house, he knew that it was highly probable that the act would result in serious bodily injury to somebody inside the house, even though he did not desire it, desire to bring that result about, he is guilty of murder. The jury convicted him of murder and the defendant appealed on the grounds of misdirection. Court of Appeal held that there was a clear misdirection. The Court of Appeal reviewed the cases of Maloney and Hancock and Shanklin and formulated a new direction from the two decisions. Lord Lane said, the jury should be directed that they are not entitled to infer the necessary intention unless they feel sure that the death or serious bodily harm was a virtual certainty barring some unforeseen intervention as a result of the defendant's actions and that the defendant appreciated that such was the case. The authority of this test was questioned in Woolen. The House of Lords largely approved of the test with some minor modifications, setting the current test of oblique intent goes like this. Where the charge is murder, and in the rare cases where the simple direction is not enough, the jury should be directed that they are not entitled to find the necessary intention unless they feel sure that the death or serious bodily harm was a virtual certainty, barring some unforeseen intervention, as a result of the defendant's actions and that the defendant appreciated that such was the case. The decision is one for the jury to be reached upon a consideration of all the evidence. Another point to note before I conclude this lecture is that foresight of consequences is not the same as intention, but only evidence of intention. This was established in R. V. Scaly 1995. Remember that the explanation of foresight of consequences in Hancock and Shanklin and the Nedrick direction where appropriate are relevant to all offenses and not just murder. In the light of these two decisions, Smith and Hogan, criminal law state, that 1. A consequence is intended when it is the accused's purpose. 2. A court or jury may also infer that a consequence is intended, though it is not desired, when a. The consequence is a virtual certain result of the act and b. The accused knows that it is a virtually certain consequence.